Well, welcome, friends, to another in our series titled The Life and Teachings of Jesus. Uh, today, my, my theme is Jesus' Discipleship Model. Jesus' Discipleship Model. I've uh, just been teaching this in our earlier morning service. And um, at its simplest, this is probably the most strategic message in the series, although in some ways perhaps the most challenging. Um, you heard earlier in the Bible reading, uh, let me just recap on that. I don't normally do that, but let me just touch on those again. Mark 1, 14 to 18. Uh, remember these words here. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of Jesus. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent, believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Now, when I first read that, um, I remember as a new believer, I, 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 I thought that might be the first time Jesus ever met them. You know, he's just spotted these guys and, you know, God the Father has led him to say, these are the ones, just go and tell them to come and follow me. But a more careful reading of Scripture, you realize, actually, no, Jesus did seem to already know these guys. He already had a relationship with them. There are other accounts. And so, if we, for instance, if we have a look at John, we discover, no, he already knew Peter. He already knew Andrew. This is more the first account of their meeting. Uh, John 1.38, it says, Turning round, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? Uh, they said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Um, I don't know. I think they didn't know what to say at this point. Um, and so they simply blurted out, uh, where are you staying? Uh, to try and give you the context, um, John the Baptist, he's been baptizing people and Jesus is present. And he says to the crowds, behold, the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And so Andrew, he, he, he and uh, another bloke, they decide, okay, we've got to go meet this Jesus. He's he must be the Messiah. So off they go. Um, and Jesus uh, yeah, graciously replied here um, when they say, where are you staying? Oh, come, he replied, and you'll see. So they went and saw where he was staying. And they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we've found the Messiah that is the Christ, and brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Um, at its simplest, discipleship starts with a calling. My first point is this, calling. Jesus called those early people to be his disciples. It starts with a calling. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that these people had to respond and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. Uh, for me, it was uh, a case of uh, the workaday environment where um, a guy called Mark Williams had many spiritual conversations with me. Fortunately, by the grace of God, it was around that time I was kind of open to Christ and open to talk. And so the end result was after many conversations, I eventually got along to the Bible study group that he went to. That's where he kept inviting me. Why don't you come along to my Bible study group? Eventually I got there. A uh, bunch of young adults. Uh, I was about 22 at the time. And uh, there was a pastor there. He led, led a few songs of worship. Then they prayed for a bit. And then he started to teach the Bible. Well, I had tons of questions. But he, he kind of settled me down because I was interrupting too much. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so why don't you meet with me next week? And, you know, we'll go through a lot of your questions then. And um, so we did that. And I think it was the second time we caught up together. He kept showing me these passages like the ones I've read today. And they were revealing that when these people came to believe in Jesus, they were encouraged to follow him. They believed and then they were encouraged to follow. They believed and they were encouraged to follow. And I, he didn't say anything, but I picked up what he was trying to help me see in the Scriptures that I had faith in Jesus, but I wasn't yet following Jesus. I'd come to believe just recently, but I wasn't yet following him. And over the next month or so, I guess I started to feel that call, that sense of I'm to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to put his kingdom first. I believe in him. I want to follow his teachings. 
And so calling's important. Now, I um, sat with a guy who's at my alpha table called Damien. Uh, this was Friday, um, just gone, but also Friday a week before. Uh, Friday a week before, we talked about baptism. And as we chatted together, um, Damien tells me a bit more of his story. Now, Damien's a guy at my alpha table, and he's, his background is the occult and spiritualism and that sort of stuff. He married a witch, seriously. Um, and he thought all these sorts of things were the, the right spiritual journey. You know, we're exploring spiritual truth. And he would take various drugs to help him have an encounter in the spiritual realm and all that sort of stuff. That's been his journey. Well, recently he's come to believe in Jesus. And now he sees Jesus as actually the entry point to a relationship with God and the only entry point. He's become a born-again Christian. He's come to the point where he's decided to follow Jesus. He's responded to that calling. I met with Susie, who's doing Alpha at Martin's table just on Friday to do a baptism study. Uh, and um, Susie, I can still remember, it was a Christmas production Sunday morning. She was here and I was out in the cafe, got talking with her. We sat down, had a coffee together. And Susie shares with me a little of her story. She just says, look, I'm, I'm from a Buddhist heritage. But look, I'm, to be honest, I'm open to Christianity. I'd like to actually explore Christianity. And I said to her, well, as you saw at the production, we're promoting this course called Alpha. I think it would be ideal for you to explore Christianity. Well, he, she's at Martin's table. And um, Martin um, mentioned to me about, it was the second weekend. That particular study is all about Jesus. And she said to her table for the first time in my life I understand who Jesus is and if you want to hear a full story come to the baptism service on the 31st the end of this month and you'll see her tell a story and be baptized she's now a follower of Jesus a born-again Christian she's come to that full relationship the more I talked with her on Friday the more I got the confidence she's born again she's committed to following Jesus new believer now friends that's the beginning of the journey, responding to Jesus' call to be his disciple. The second thing I want you to have a look at here, Mark 138, it says this, Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. Notice that. That is why I've come, so I can preach in various places. So he traveled throughout Galilee preaching in their synagogues. So my second point is this, number two, teaching. Teaching was key for these early believers. Um, Jesus taught in the synagogues. He said, that's why he's come. Jesus taught the crowds, saying that is why he's come. Um, for you and I, as a, a disciple of Jesus, this is important. And I remember for myself as a new believer, um, I uh, went to my church twice on Sundays to listen to the preached word of God. I would visit another church as well Sunday evenings. Uh, there was one in particular that I had friends, developed friends at and uh, would go to that one in particular, but I went to a few different ones to sit under the preached word of God. I started listening to um, an American preacher. Some of you will know of him, Charles Swindle. And uh, I would listen to his messages regularly. In fact, I would be no ex exaggeration to so say I've listened to thousands of them. Uh, I listened to one this week again. Uh, why? Because I believe the preached word of God is essential. Just as Jesus did all this teaching with these new believers and potential believers, so we today need to sit under the taught word of God. By the way, if um, uh, you're thinking to yourself, well, I, I missed one of the sermons in this series. Just remember, they're all online. I had someone ask me last Sunday, are, are, are our messages online that we do on a Sunday morning? And I said, yes, they are. You go to the church, go to our website, go to the church menu, look at sermons, click on sermons, and it'll be the latest two or three. And then if you click on, you know, um, uh, more sermons, it'll give you the whole list from, you know, way back for the last couple of years. And just find the date, the one you've missed, listen to the message or watch the message. You know, let me suggest the power of God's preached word is essential for Christian growth. Mark 4.10 says this, when he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. Um, you, you notice this here that um, it was more than Jesus teaching the crowds or teaching in the synagogues. His disciples also entered into discussion. Discussion was key. 
Um, and of course, uh, it's a small group environment where here they're, they're, they've heard Jesus share some stories, parables, some of which they've understood, some of which perhaps they didn't fully understand. And so they want to talk further about it. They engage in discussion. Another key in the discipleship process. Um, I remember for myself as a new believer, uh, I would... Um, I would attend a couple of Bible studies. One, there was one on Thursday, one on Tuesday, each of those fortnightly, to discuss the Word of God. Made that a priority. Um, and there was another little group that I used to meet with. The pastor took uh, three of us under his wing, uh, the senior pastor of the church, and he would meet with us one-on-one, -on -one, once a fortnight, and in a group of four, the three of us and, and him, over lunch, Every second week, I guess a small group environment where again we would discuss the Word of God. Of course, the Alpha groups are the same sort of example where people, we, we listen to some teaching from Nicky Gumbel and others, we hear the testimonies, the stories of people's lives, and then we open the Bible, we look at some of the references that they've made to the Scriptures, and we discuss them. Um, the small group Bible study is a classic place of discussion. And uh, you heard mentioned uh, John Manderson's group on Wednesday nights, 8 o'clock in the cafe. All are welcome. Come along and dig further into the life and teachings of Jesus. Next area. Let me have a look at this um, area of modeling. Uh, 132. Look, look, at here, look at this here, how Jesus, it says, That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who were ill and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. And so here Jesus is observed by the disciples as he prays for the sick and sees them healed, or, or as um, he deals with someone who's got some sort of demonic problem. He modeled power encounters to his disciples. Or Mark 6, 1-2, it says, Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. So here again, remember, Jesus is here preaching in these various settings, but his disciples are on the front row. They're learning how to preach. Peter becomes an, an amazing preacher, but he sat under Jesus preaching and watched how Jesus modeled effective preaching. Or we think here of Mark 1 to 3. It says, During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have had nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. And so he literally states it. He says, I'm feeling compassion for these people. It's as if he's wanting the disciples to see this. You know, we need to be a people who have compassion on one another. There is a sense of love there being modelled. Or Luke 11, 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. I don't know what it was. Perhaps Jesus' intimacy with the Father, or, or perhaps it was Jesus' power as he prayed. But they saw what he did, and they thought, I need to learn more about this. Teach us how to pray. Jesus modelled how to pray. My point is this. Number four, Modeling is key in discipleship. Modeling, whether ministry or mission. You know, I remember for me as a new believer, the um, pastor of the church, he said to me uh, that he was doing a series of teaching over a long weekend, but like this one. And uh, so the, uh, I, he said, why don't you come with me? So we traveled down. It's a bit of a journey in the car anyway, a good couple of hours to get there. And just a lot of talking in the car. But then, at the center, as he preached various messages, I watched how he ministered to people in that context. I can still remember the theme. He was pe preaching from Ephesians, talking about putting off of the old, bringing on of the new. And uh, as he taught about that, I still remember this chap after one of his sermons coming up to him, puzzled expression, trying to, uh, tr trying to find out what Kim really meant by that. And as I watched the conversation, I could see the chap he was a church attender, but he'd never experienced that transformation God's Spirit brings. The old is gone, the new has come, the transforming work of the Spirit. And I watched Kim help him through to that place of being a born-again Christian. 
Um, in, in the small group Bible studies, I remember watching how Kim would pray for people or how he'd ask them questions, how he'd engage people. Um, I, I remember uh, watching Kim as he was very much a learner, not just a teacher. And uh, on one of the occasions when we were meeting in that group of three over lunch with Kim teaching us, he occasionally would have someone staying with him. He had another pastor staying with him who was traveling to do some ministry. He came along. And as that pastor did some of the teaching as well as Kim, and I watched as Kim with his wide margin Bible jot down notes as the other pastor taught. You see, he was a learner. He modelled learning. Well, friends, modelling is key in this journey of Jesus' style of discipleship. Have a look here at this next passage, Mark 6, 7. It says, Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. And then jumping to verse 12, we read a bit about it. Uh, They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed with oil many people who were ill and healed them. And so Jesus has been modeling all this with the disciples, whether it's how he taught or how he healed the sick. Now he sent them out to do the very things that he was doing. Um, Sending is another key point. Sending. Um, at its simplest friends um, uh, Kim made sure that was a part of my life too the pastor of the church he said look um, we've got there are some youth dimension coffee shop events coming up I think you should go on them and so it was a couple around the summer period I was on holidays and so went off and uh, joined this group of about 30 people mostly young adults and um, there was a, a pastor who was kind of in charge of it. He was more middle-aged. And, um, and, and so we, we did, did this outreach, this mission. And I was in a beachy sort of uh, area. And we hired this hall not far from the beach. There's a lot of people traffic there, people walking past. Decked out the hall with a stage PA system. And um, put up all these tables, these coffee tables. And uh, we'd put this white butcher's paper on the coffee tables and always have some textures and stuff there on the tables. And and young people would come in and Metallica was big at the time. So there'd be all these Metallica sign of um, symbols and artwork they'd put there. And um, and the idea was we Christians, we'd mingle around the tables and we'd get talking. On the hour, a band would get up and do a a few songs like at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock don't think we did 12 o'clock and the band would would do about three numbers and then someone would share their testimony and in the journey of that then that would really naturally open up conversation around the tables and uh, while this is all going on there's a group of uh, people are praying in one room and a group of people are serving food and um, coffee hot chocolate tea and and sweet stuff to go with it and, um, and you, you'd rotate about every 20 minutes, do 20 minutes on the tables evangelizing, 20 minutes in the kitchen, 20 minutes in the prayer room. And so Kim encouraged me to get out and do some mission. And so I did that several times. Um, but of course, he sent me into ministry, you might say, as well. He got me involved. So I started leading worship at church. I uh, started leading a teenage Bible study. I went out and did some door-to-door evangelism. I started speaking occasionally at youth camps and started preaching at the church. Uh, and so he engaged me into mission, sent me into mission in the uh, in ministry, rather, in the local church. Sending is key. Mark 6.30, we read these words, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Notice that. The disciples came back to Jesus after that mission that they were sent on. They came back and told him all about it. They reported how it went. And um, that's exactly what Kim got me to do when I'd come back from a youth dimension outreach. He'd get me to report. You know, what worked, what didn't work, what was effective, why something wasn't effective, how it'd gone leading people to Christ. Um, you know how the team had worked together lots of questions how my quiet times went during that time you know as we talked through we re- I'd report back and I remember the first one of these I went on it was wonderful you know we saw a bunch of young people come to faith in Christ six reporting one more Mark 6 31 says this then 
because many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Number seven, reflection. Reflection is important. Jesus encouraged his disciples to get away from the busyness of mission and ministry at times, get some space, have some time to reflect. Might be alone in prayer, might be just relaxing, but getting some space. Um, I remember uh, my pastor, he encouraged me to sometimes get away for an extended time of prayer. So I, I would drive into a forest area and I'd spend hours in prayer and in the word, just in a quiet place, getting alone, allowing God to refresh, to restore, allowing opportunity for reflection. Um, he also said, if you ever go into the ministry, Lee, one of the things that is very important is you learn the practice of a, a Sabbath day, that one day a week that you take time out, that you take a, a day off away from the ministry completely. Reflection, rest, is important. Seven principles, friends. Let's go through them. Recapping. Number one, principles Jesus used in making disciples. Calling, teaching, discussion, modeling, sending, reporting, reflection. Calling, teaching, discussion, modeling, sending, reporting, reflection. I wonder, did it work? Well, we have a look in the early church in the book of Acts. And um, in Acts 2, 42 to 47, we have a bit of a snapshot of what the early church looked like. Now, um, it comes shortly after this description, comes shortly after Peter gets up on the day of Pentecost and preaches. He'd learned his great preaching skills from Jesus. 3,000 committed their life to Jesus and they were baptized that very day. And then... We read a little bit about what this early church looked like. Let me share it with you. Acts 2.42. It says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and at the many wonders and signs that were performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Oh, I mean, that's a powerful description. That sounds like one healthy, vibrant church. Did Jesus' discipleship process work? Well, it appears that it did. Remember the 12 that he discipled? And then there was the 70 that is also mentioned in the scriptures? Those key players, interesting, there was about 120 gathered for prayer as we read in the early chapters of Acts. Sounds a bit like the, the 70 and the 12 and perhaps a few more, you know. It's uh, interesting that, isn't it? Those key players were sufficient to build the foundations of a church. Now, friends, I, I will say that seminary today in the West is very different to the way Jesus made disciples. Uh, it's to be honest at its simplest I would suggest it's a very academic approach I remember when I went to Bible college and mine was supposed to be a relatively practical one but I did four years of Bible college and I tell you what I reckon I don't think I'd be exaggerating 90% of what we did was really academic it was it was um, studying of theologians studying of the scripture and typing up lots of assignments and sitting exams that was most of it I at, at if I was really generous, it'd be 85% of it. I did a couple of short-term missions. We did do practical stuff, but honestly, it was a small proportion. The problem is that approach, I believe, it's a lots of left-brain stuff going on, but there's not much ministry experience. And you end up looking a bit like this. A lot of head knowledge there, but there's something not quite right. Um, Jesus' model was much more of an apprenticeship style. The disciples learnt on the job, and I think that skills people up much better. Uh, um, Charles Spurgeon knew this. Spurgeon pastored what was probably the largest church in the 1800s in Britain, 
a church that he packed twice a Sunday with 6,000 seats, 12,000 attendants, 14,000 members. Charles wasn't happy with the Bible colleges of his day. He started his own Bible college and there was two things that he wasn't happy about with it. He said, first of all, that there is, there is, there's a lack of spirituality in the Bible colleges. He said, they produce, the Bible colleges are producing sapless essayists, to quote Spurgeon, sapless essayists. You remember the, um, the uh, first message in this series where we looked at the vine and we know we, we were talking about uh, here with this, this vine that the, the sap that comes up through this vine is essential for the branches to be nourished and to bear fruits. What Spurgeon was saying was that there's a lack of life in these Bible college graduates. And secondly, he said that they're not practically trained, that they can, churn, they can tune out a, a finely presented academic work an essay but when it comes to practical ministry they are hopelessly inadequate and so here's bible college with both a big emphasis on spirituality and practical ministry along with the academic a more balanced approach um you know i must admit for me having gone to bible college uh if that had been the sum of my training i'd have been hopelessly underprepared but fortunately, in my church environment, uh, with the help of um, a pastor of the church and other key leaders, I was given all manner of practical ministry experience. And I don't think in the West much has changed. I think today, the place that people need to find that practical development is within the local church. Often in Asia, Africa and Latin America, their, their training, some of their training colleges are much more practical much more like jesus style but in the west generally they're academic so friends it doesn't mean that that's going to stop dramatic growth in the west but it does mean that the churches have a very very important role to play let me remind you of the words of the great commission matthew 28 18 then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then Jesus' parting words before he ascends to heaven. He's asking his followers to make disciples disciples and as an outward expression of that discipleship be baptized let me encourage you again today remember uh, we mentioned a baptism service if you're thinking well i haven't been baptized yet come and come and meet with me We'd love to chat through baptism what it's all about uh, there's a sign up sheet at the back of the auditorium if you want to pop your name down to be baptized or at least explore what that means please do I wonder, how would you feel about becoming a disciple maker? Someone who makes disciples. As challenging as that may sound. What do I mean in regards to doing this? Well, let me describe it this way. Meeting with one person for one hour a week for one year. It's a nice little summary of the commitment. Uh, actually, that's what my pastor did with me. One person, one hour a week for one year. Uh, and now what, what will that time look like together? Well, I went through a series of studies. We didn't just look at the study. We talked about life. We prayed together. But it was based in some studies to prepare me as a new believer. And the one I'm recommending first is this one simply called Lessons on Assurance. It's a navigator's booklet. It's one that has been used, you know, uh, by the tens of millions around the world. Tens of millions of people have done this one. Very popular still. Very practical, sets a good foundation. And to make this a little bit easier for you, um, probably drop that for the moment now, um, to make this a little bit easier for you, um, next term, I'm thinking of teaching five messages based on this book just to make it that little bit more accessible for you as a congregation 
Because to be frank, I believe we've got to be serious about discipleship. We've got to do everything we can to get better at making disciples. Um, and the second book I'd recommend is this one. It's actually one our new young adults pastor would recommend too. Uncover. It's, the John, it's John's gospel, so it's encouraged them to get into a whole gospel. And uh, in the journey of doing this, they read a few chapters each week and they jot down a few thoughts and answer a few questions. And again, you meet with them to go through that booklet one-on-one. Another booklet I'd recommend is this one here, Lessons on Christian Living. It's another Navigator's book. It kind of sets the foundations, the practical foundations of what they're to believe and how they behave as a Christian. Eight parts. So far, five part, a six part one, and this is an eight part one. Now to show how um, intentional the series is that we're doing at the moment, what I'm recommending you also do with a new believer is this book that we're exploring right now, The Life and Teachings of Jesus. Because it's one thing to ground the person in Christian faith, it's another thing that they actually do a study that is encouraging them to go and make disciples. It's not just about them being a disciple, they need to get to the place where they're willing to make disciples. And of course, this is what this book is largely about. And finally, one more that I'd recommend, and it's, um, to be honest, one of the great needs, mostly in the West, not so much in some countries, but very much in the West, we seem to have lost the confidence and skill when it comes to sharing the gospel with people. It's all manner of ways we can do that. And so quite intentional also last year, when we looked at this one, Spring Into Action, this study book that what I'd be recommending is part of that discipleship journey with that person you actually take them through this and look at the eight different kind of examples that we see in scripture of how various people of the New Testament led someone to believe now you package those together and you end up with someone who's actually well equipped to become a disciple maker they're solidly grounded themselves in faith in Jesus and they're at a place where they're ready to both lead someone to Christ and make a disciple. Let's just put, put it up again. These five different uh, study books. Recommended discipleship studies. Lessons on assurance, uncover the gospel of John, lessons on Christian living, the life and teachings of Jesus and spring into action. That's 33 studies in total. Obviously, there's some room for some other stuff there. Over a year, there's 52 weeks, not 33. Um, And what I'd recommend is there are a few other obvious things that they need to do. They need to do a study on baptism at some point. Uh, They need to look at sharing their testimony in relation to their baptism day as well. They need to also consider things such as it'd be good to look at a little spiritual gifts course. What are their spiritual gifts? And look at some of the ministries of the church, how they could get involved. It's, It's those things as well. They could be added on. Um, now that's the one hour stuff you do with them complete the study encourage them to complete it by themselves they may struggle to do that especially early on meet with them go through it with them talk about life with them pray with them answer some of the questions they may have in the journey Um, but besides that meeting with them I'm suggesting you're doing life with them so if you come for instance to this service or one of the other services at this church encourage them to come to that service with you or uh, friends if uh, for instance you're a part of a small group bible study or an alpha group or whatever you might be going to encourage them to come to that with you if you're involved in a certain ministry of the church encourage them to get involved in that ministry as well and in the journey of, of, of getting to know them more you're probably going to start to identify certain gifts that they may have Uh, For instance, if they're good with meeting new people um, and connecting with those who might be new to church, introduce them to Marion, who heads up our our newcomers ministry. Or it might be that they've, they've got a real heart for people and pastoral care. They've got that compassion. Introduce them to Marge. They could become part of her pastoral care team. Or if they've got a heart for youth, ministering to teenagers in the church, introduce them to our new pastor, Josh. Get them help out in the youth ministry. Or it might be children that they've got a heart for. Introduce them to Melissa, our children's pastor, so they can get involved in that ministry. Or they might be a musician or a singer. 
introduce them to Jeanette and we can get them auditioned and if they're up to, you know, if they're a reasonable musician or singer, become a part of the praise and worship teams. Or if they're good at tech, you know, media stuff, sound, lighting, camera, whatever, introduce them to Andreas and get them involved. You see, the concept is here, we're thinking holistically about this person's journey. We want to see in a year or so, that person is a strong believer in Jesus, they've been discipled, they're ready to disciple others and they're active in ministry. Now just imagine, you might say, tell him he's dreaming, but just imagine. A bunch of people from this church took this seriously and actually said, hey, I'm willing to make a disciple. I'm willing to actually do something of what the Great Commission is all about. Go, therefore, and make disciples. I'm actually willing to say, yeah, I'm willing to take Jesus' word seriously enough to say, I'll do it. I'll obey his teaching. I'll make his teaching a priority. Let's say 25 of you were willing to take that on. 25 people. To say, yep, look, I'm up for it. We're starting the process at some of our alpha tables. All of our alpha tables have a mixture of believers, non-believers, and we're trying to link people up. I said to um, one of our lovely young adult girls, actually, um, just recently, about discipling um, one of the girls at her table who's also, is, who is just a new believer. And, um, and she said, oh, but she has such difficult questions. I could never do that. <laughs> and, um, and that's a very honest answer, isn't it? But at the same time, I encourage you to th- think through it. I think you're, you're, you're stronger, you're more mature than what you realize. I think you'd do a great job. It's more a case of just being willing to commit to it. And she's looking at me at the moment as I share this story. <laughs> um, friends, it might seem initially as I share this, that sounds really challengingly. Well, have a chat with me. If you got into trouble one week and said, oh, I can't believe the question they asked. I had nowhere to go. You know what that guy at, um, in my workplace used to do? Sometimes I'd send him a curly question. And you know what he'd say? He'd have a crack at answering and then he'd say, you know what? Why don't, why don't you come to this Bible study I keep asking you to come to and meet the pastor and he will give you a more thorough answer of that. I'm very happy if you've got someone you think this is a big issue for them, I'm very happy to come and bring them into the office one day and have a chat with them. You know, we want to help and equip you as a congregation to become disciple makers. Now let's say there's 25 of you who are willing to actually take this on and 25 of you actually make disciples over the next um, year. Uh, Well, that 25 by the end of this year can mean there's 50 disciple makers in the church because remember these people that you're discipling they're going to become disciple makers themselves Kim as he was discipling me would remind me of that every few weeks I'm doing this Lee so you can in turn do this with someone else and then what about if um, that 50 in a year's time made disciples again so the first 25 you make a new disciple and the people you've been discipling make a disciple as well that 50 then by the beginning of year three becomes 100 and if you do it again the next year of course that 100 can become 200 you do it again by year five that 200 can become 400 400 people experienced at making disciples it'll look something like this multiplying disciples over five years if you tally up all of our congregations we've got about 400 people that call this church home now in five years we could double the size of the church but not only that we've got hundreds of people able to make disciples So when Jesus told us to make disciples, this multiplying principle, you can see how strategic and how powerful it is. 
Immediately, I know you'll be thinking, well, I've got other priorities in my life. I'm sure you have. But to consider one hour a week to commit to that person for one year and a bit of other stuff where you're going to get them along to church, you're going to get them involved in a small group or ministry. It's not that much we're asking. I'm not asking you to give up your job and travel preaching with them like Jesus asked them to. So really, it's a pretty small commitment. Are we up for it? What do you think? You feel inadequate? Of course you will. Of course you won't feel like you've got the skills. Have a crack at it. Good Aussie saying for uh, Josh, have a crack at it, mate. Go on. Stone the craze, you might be surprised, mate. It's truth. Why not? Well, as the worship team returns, let me pray for you. Let's be upstanding. Your friends, one of the things I've provided today uh, at the back of the church at our, our information table, there is a sign up document. It simply just says, yep, I'm up for it. I'm willing to make disciples. You pop your name and number down on there, we'll consider that you're willing to have a crack at it. And my hope is that we could become a discipleship, a disciple making church possibly the most important thing we could do when you consider Jesus emphasis on it let me pray for you and your endeavors father I want to lift the congregation before you right now I realize for some they're feeling inadequate others are feeling how could I fit that into my schedule others are just thinking I'm not doing it but Lord I do pray that your prompting will be real that your word will have its rightful place in our lives and we would feel the necessity to respond to the scriptures, respond to the teachings of Jesus. So I want to pray here today that people would feel that I'm not doing this alone. The grace of God will carry me. Jesus never calls us to do things or, or challenges us through his teaching to do things without also providing the equipping of his spirits. And so, Father, I pray that people with that knowledge, that you are alongside, that today people would be willing to commit to making disciples in Jesus' name. Amen.